You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 104, part one of The Dental Guys commentary on zero bone loss concepts by Tomas Linkovicius. Tomas Linkovicius has been a part of The Dental Guys since the beginning. What do we mean by that? Well, we have taken his concepts over the years and made them part of our practice. They are what we base our current implant practice on, and now the book is here. We're gonna talk about the first few chapters in this episode and talk to you about why this book may be the most important book on implant dentistry published in the modern era of implants. Join us for more on that today on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out The Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, it's here. It's the really the episode we've been wanting to record for some time now. Yep. We are going to produce what we think could be one of the greatest things that we've ever covered as far as from a literature-based perspective. We've really never covered a book, and that's textbook. what we're going to do. Yeah. Is we're going to cover an entire textbook on this show. Zero. And before you turn it off, before you turn us off, right? hold on, hold on. Because now, I, if you've listened to us for a while, you know this yeah. is not, this is what we do, right? But if you're new to the show and you tuned into this episode because it said zero bone loss, like what? Mm. Like why would you be saying zero bone loss concepts? Well, before you turn us off, hear us out. Ever since we've started talking about implants on the show, I mean, it's one of the first shows we ever did. We talked about Tomas Linkovicius. And, and why do we get so fixated on this guy? Because he was doing some things. I, it goes back, way back. I remember seeing Stephen Chu years ago. This is probably back in 2013, 2014. 20, 2013, 2014. Yeah. And he says at a, at a symposium, he says, guys, the way we've been thinking about bone loss is completely wrong. Yeah, but and they still teach it in schools, John, because oh, yeah. we ask it at RDI, Restorative Driven Implants, how many people that have recently graduated in education still hear that you should expect bone loss around your implants in the first yeah. year? It's normal to expect 1.5 millimeters or down to the first thread on implants in the modern era. And he said, you know, the way we've been thinking about this and the way we've been measuring it and the way we've been determining what matters about all these marketing, is it marketing or is it not? But all these marketing things, you know, like platform switching and laser micro texturing and rough and surface versus smooth surface, all this stuff. And he kind of just said, guys, I'm not telling you that those things don't matter. But what I'm telling you is there's a lot more to the story. And the person that is pioneering this research is this guy out of Lithuania. And I'm kind of listening to this going, really? Is this really? Come on, one guy, and he said, yeah, he said, I know this sounds crazy, but he said, I went to his office because I didn't believe that this one guy was kind of capable of putting out this quality of research, and he just goes, guys, he's legit. He's legit. This is real. <laughs> this is not fake, and then since this time, we're going to go into all the concepts, but since this time, his concepts have been supported over and over and over again through other authors who have confirmed what Linkovicius first said about what really influences bone loss. But it wasn't until this last year, Wes, that, I mean, you know he's been working on this book a long time, but that it actually put, he put everything together. We've been waiting for this. Um, one of the people that will get an opportunity to interview uh, in the near future um, is John... Tomas Likovicus, hopefully uh, he'll be on our show, and I think that that's going to be made possible by a very special announcement that I think we need to make right now. Uh, I think it's, it's time. It's probably time, because it's, it's probably fitting. Time. It's very <clears throat> fitting that we talk a little bit about the relationship that we've made with the Academy of Osteointegration. We have been asked 
Um, the dental guys have been asked to cover the Academy of Osteo Integration annual meeting in 2020 in Seattle. We will be there um, and covering it in a big way. We are super excited to bring this, guys, to you uh, next year in 2020. John, tell us a little bit about what we're going to be doing there and who we're going to be oh. talking to. I mean, several years ago, <clears throat> Wes and I, as you know, if you've listened to this show for a while, we started producing episodes on the AO meeting. And Annual recap. Every time we'd go to the meeting, we were just these guys, you know, these total nerds listening to it. And we were doing our own little show, totally unsanctioned by the AO. It was just what we were want, talking about because we were right. there at the meeting. So the AO, finally, after talking and listening and talking back and forth, you know, we, we kind of said, hey, would you guys ever be interested in having us do something with the AO meeting? Because we, we love it. We love it. We believe in the organization. We know what you're trying to do. And we think that, you know, maybe this could help expand your audience. So they kind of listened to what we were doing. They liked the direction we were going. <clears throat> it just seemed like a good fit. So we're super excited because what, what we're going to be doing there, and we're still getting all the details kind of put together as far as what it's going to look like, but something along the lines of we'll have a, a broadcast area there and as some of the top implant speakers in the world come off stage, or maybe before they speak after, we're going to get access to them. We're going to be able to ask them about their topics, ask them about the most uh, critical parts of their talk. We're going to get to give them some, hopefully some good questions, really put their feet to the fire a little bit about what they're talking about, maybe even talk about things that AO can't really talk about, like products, because they try to be totally neutral, which I get, and that's awesome. But we can ask them about, well, how does this product actually get affected by the thing you're talking about on the stage? You know, They can actually mm -hmm. maybe talk to some of that stuff, and maybe we can get a couple of opposing viewpoints at a super high level to have a really good productive debate on what is the best concept to use in how you treat these patients. I mean, some of the names at this meeting, I mean, the the the, the scientific chair is Craig Mish, you know? Yeah. I mean, you ever heard of that guy? You know, he, he's probably going well, to bring... Probably going to bring the goods. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we're at, we actually have an opportunity to speak um, at the Young Clinicians Luncheon. So if you're yeah. having an opportunity to be there at that, that's anybody that's from uh, zero to 10 years out of school. Wes, we're speaking <laughs> I, at the AO. I just... Pinch what? me right now, man. I mean, seriously, this is such I, an honor. We can't um, uh, express how excited we are to be able to help. Hey, listen, if you can't come to the AO, we're going for you. Yeah. And we're going to be there. We want your interaction. Uh, while yep. we're there, we're going to be possibly doing some live broadcasting. You know we're going to be bringing the AO Recap Show in a big way this time right. because of our collaboration. And, if, and you are, know what? If you weren't thinking about going to the AO, you are now. Well, I, I don't know why that. you wouldn't come and see the dental guys, right? Yeah, because I mean, if you were just we'll thinking there. this is, maybe you were thinking this is a specialist meeting or it's no. an old person meeting or We've it's only it's for not. people that are just, you know, teaching. No, this is, in our opinion, the premier implant meeting. We've said it for years. It's not and new. And it's in a great city this year. Yeah, it's Seattle. In Seattle. Get some coffee hey, with us. Yeah. Hey, listen, come grab a cup of coffee. Um, this year at the AO with the dental guys. Um, honestly, it's going to be amazing. Uh, well, when is it? It's in March. It's March 18th through the 21st, um, 2020. Get your tickets. Sign up now. Go over to osseo.org. .org, that's right. Osseo.org. And, hey, look, sign up to come see the dental guys and to come see an amazing lineup. You yep. aren't going to... You aren't going to be disappointed. It's no, going to be no. epic. And listen, that's just I'm just excited about it. So we're going to get into this book because um, we are super excited about what um, this book has done for us. Uh, it's mm -hmm. confirmed some things. It's supported the way we practice. And so after a word from our sponsor, we're going to start breaking down the book that we've all been wanting to hear about, Zero Bone Loss Concepts from Tomas Linkovicus. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with Financially Simple. So we're talking about increasing the value of your dental practice. In order to understand how to increase the value, we must understand where value comes from. In an oversimplified form, value is ultimately determined by revenue 
multiply by a multiple. So for example, let's say your practice produces $2 million in collections, that's the revenue, and the multiple is 70%, then the value would be $1.4 million. Knowing this, we can focus on increasing the revenue or the multiple. But which provides the largest net worth increase? Increase the multiple, the revenue should increase, and your net worth will dramatically increase. We'll examine how to increase the multiple in the upcoming episodes. As always, if you have any questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via FinanciallySimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to FinanciallySimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. Well, welcome back, and uh, we're excited to start into uh, this book. And you know, we, Wes and I have talked a lot about this as far as how to organize this because there's so much information. And you know, the way we roll, we are not just going to read this to you. We're not going to, you know, yeah. be the audio book here. What we're going to do? Well, the first thing you need to do break is it go down. over and purchase the book, right? Yeah, you need. You to, don't have you need the to book. Go, go buy it. And by the time we finish this first episode, if you don't believe us that, that you need this, then you're crazy. I mean, you're going to want it. This is going to be something as a reference that you'll want. If you're a general dentist or a sort of dentist uh, who does not place implants, that's you're totally gonna fine. This. You're going to want this, and you're going to want to share it with your specialist. I'm currently uh, hanging out every two weeks with one of my oral surgeon friends, and what we do is we eat dinner and we talk about this book because it's so important that your specialists yep. understand it. So I love... When we go through the introduction to this book, I love that Tomas decided to really talk about what is important and why he created this book. And one of the things he talks about is he talks about how case reports can be so misleading yeah. that anybody can get up there. And what he calls it, he calls it a new term, podium dentistry, podium well, dentistry. So John... <laughs> <laughs> let's stop right there and let's comment on this because this has kind of been our thing over the last, say, 24 to 36 months Yes, that we see a lot of podium dentistry and not necessarily coming from the stage, per se, at a meeting, but I feel like the new podium is this social media thing that we exactly. hear Exactly. Facebook that, is not a peer-reviewed journal. We, yeah, we talked, we had that, that was that our episode. episode. Before. And yep. so I think that what Tom Oss is saying here is we need to be very, very careful yep. about podium dentistry. Okay. Yeah, his whole thought is that podium dentistry is, and I'm just going to read straight from it, refers to clinicians presenting only their good experiences rather than the entire picture, including complications. And the idea in the very next heading is scientific research. That's right. And he says, you know, that this is, it can be a challenge for this to be taken seriously because it's often viewed as too far removed or even boring. And he says, to be fair, evidence-based dentistry is, of course, the ideal, but it's seldom achieved because the truth is that clinical studies are very difficult to perform correctly and without bias. So you get this result where the scientific and clinical world start to distrust each other, which is the worst outcome. So the true success is achieved when treatment is performed based on clinical evidence with the appropriate logic and technical skills. It's the See, integration of science and clinical. So I think that that's the thing here is that there seems to be, there always has been this dichotomy, let's say, between what is actually practice and what is actually researched. And I don't <clears throat> think that we need to, we need to create that. We need to, we actually need to be careful about that. That is is a very dangerous way to practice. In mm. fact, it's very important that Tomas brought this up here as he says that it is that this book is not based just on clinical findings and case report. It is based mostly on controlled clinical trials and soundly designed in vitro, in vitro studies. And so relying on case reports, as Tomas says here, it's quite dangerous. And we have to be very, very careful about this type of podium dentistry. We heard some people say, in my hands, it just feels like I'm yep. seeing this. That is podium dentistry. Yep. You have to be very, very careful. Controlled clinical <clears throat> trials, systematic reviews. Um, yep. And all his these whole things. thing here, he says, hey, guys, I've actually done – this is one of the few people – who can write a book and can actually cite his own research for the majority of this. And it's not just a case report, as he says. It's 
clinical controlled clinical trials. And he cites over, I think it's 30 articles here that were his group, either him or his group going back to 2008 Mm -hmm. and ending in 2019. So this is a very modern book talking about how he has basically uh, evolved this understanding of what supports this zero bone loss concepts. He goes to great lengths to talk about the fact that, you know, hey, somebody may come up with, they'll show a case report. They'll show a rubber dam over an abutment right. Right. to help reduce cement. And they'll they'll just put this case report up on Facebook or on the podium. And then, you know, actually when he did a controlled clinical study, demonstrated completely opposite results. And so the rubber dam he found in this controlled clinical trial is not able to, but if you put it on the podium, you show a case, it looks really cool. So the idea is, we have to be looking at what's possible clinically, and we have to also respect the science that's behind it. We can't ignore either one. And I love the fact that he says, you know, case reports are subjective and resemble the opinions of the authors. This must be kept in mind when attending courses, listening to lectures, or reading textbooks. The level of evidence is important. So the idea behind this book here is to create a balance between sound clinical science uh, or scientific evidence and then sound clinical logic to, and basically to provide this best outcome for the patient. So the one thing that we really do like about this book is that it does <clears throat> marry clinical practice and um and science. And one thing I'll say about the book before we actually get into the chapter by chapter, this is a beautifully designed book. Mm-hmm. The way the way the book is laid out, it's laid out in a surgical, um, first 10 chapters are surgical in nature. And that's section one, surgical concepts. And then the second book, uh, second part of the book is a restorative um, a restorative in nature. So you've got 10 chapters on uh, surgical, and then you've got 10 chapters on prosthetic, uh, restorative things. And these all things that he shows how each thing builds to promote this idea of zero bone loss concepts. It's beautifully laid out. The way the chapters are read in, in summary, there's a summation at the end of every chapter with bullet points. So it's, I think it's important to take those bullet points and apply them to your clinical practice. Also think the photography in this book, John, was next level. Oh yeah, um, he did High a very quality. good job with with the photography. It is one of the best books when it comes to clinical photography that I've seen. When it comes to promoting some type of clinical procedure or a way to achieve a certain result, so it's very, mm. very good, very, very well documented. Yep. So that brings us to the time we've all been waiting for, Chapter One. Chapter One. Chapter One. Here we go. Surgical factors for establishing. Crestal bones, uh, crestal bone stability. So basically, th- th- this chapter to me is one of these chapters that kind of sets the foundation, John, of mm-hmm. what are we seeing cl- truly clinically, and what factors are we do we need to take into account when it comes to crestal bone stability and yeah. this idea that hey no matter what you're always going to get 1.5 millimeters of bone loss around your implant that's just not true but why is why do we see bone growth with some implants why do we see bone growth with some restorative options what are the factors that are affecting this surgically. So I think that uh, crestal bone loss, like what he says right here, um, has been accompanied with implant treatment for so long that it has become the norm and and has even been classified into different types. And so we've, we, we even talked about this. This is like early bone loss and then mm-hmm. slowly progressing over time. I was taught in dental school that you're going to see like 1 to 1.5 millimeters of bone loss in the first year up to the first thread. And then it progresses at 0.1 millimeters per year for the next ever how many years. I kept yep. always thinking about this. Well, we're not really seeing that in some situations. Like should we expect <clears> – <throat> a half a millimeter of bone loss every five years around our dental implants. And it's just interesting yeah, to me. Yeah, uh, because earlier, uh, you know, Albertson's group and Zarb, they said 0.2 per year is considered normal. 
And right. so, yeah, you start thinking if you got a, you know, you got a 10 millimeter implant, well, I mean, you know, it's going to be gone for the time. It's a time. Yeah. Like it's a time <laughs> bomb. It's a ticking time bomb. So you better hope you put it in when they're old enough to get function out of that. Or what are you going to do when it's, but yet, like you said, Wes, we didn't always see that. In fact, right. we very rarely saw that type of progression, at least from the time that you and I have been practicing. But when it did happen, what did we say? Well, as long as it's only 0.2 or less per year, we accepted that as as normal, as a normal mm-hmm. part of implant dentistry. And the, But it was especially this whole crater or saucer defect yeah. that would happen in this early loss. Um, and, and then there were these, and then as he puts in here, there were also these studies that were coming out that implants with micro threads in the neck region and a conical mm-hmm. connection may be expected to only have 0.33 to 0.56 millimeters of bone loss within 12 months. So there's this interesting, and this was where the marketing started, you know, Wes, yeah. this was where when we were I, 10 years ago <clears throat> or so, if you remember what companies, and we don't even have to talk about the companies right now, but companies were saying, oh, you remember that whole 1.5 millimeters of bone loss? Well, because of these features, whatever that was, <clears throat> they were saying these design features, well, you just don't, you just won't see that in our implant. And if you do see them in our implant, then the next thing was, well, let me tell you what this was. Uh, bone density problems. Right. Uh, overloading occlusal overload. because of occlusal right. forces. Yeah. Right. And maybe this was a, a, a perio problem. Maybe right. this was a, you know, a, a hygiene problem, whatever. And really this whole thing was so nebulous, man. It was like, what is really going on here? Okay. Mm. Bronemark and Zarb and their group and or, or Albertson and Zarb, they're saying it's fine to lose 1.5 plus, and then this minus 0.2 every year. And then some implant companies are saying, no, we don't lose more than 0.3 to 0.5, and it's because of this amazing connection or whatever. And then you got all these reasons for why we lose bone that seem to be so variable, and yet you would see cases, Wes, with the same implant design. Yeah, it's crazy. The same implant design, and one case would be losing, and one case wouldn't be, and it seemed like sometimes it was like, you know, occlusion, occlusion seemed to be the thing, sometimes it was perio. And then... He comes out here and says, it's the author's belief that old standards in implant dentistry where one millimeter of bone loss is thought to be normal should no longer be considered valid. In fact, bone can have different reactions, such as the following, zero bone loss, stable remodeling, progressive bone loss, bone demineralization and remineralization, corticalization, or bone growth. So this this high, this thing that basically what he's saying is is that we need to just forget the old. We know enough now that you can have a whole host of things happen around implants. But what are the things that promote basically <clears throat> his coined term, zero bone loss? And he's the one that kind of coined this term, crestal bone stability basically what are the factors that give us what we all want to see right we don't want to see basically progressive bone loss right we don't want to see bone demineralization even though those are things that can happen what we want to see is this stability and or a promotion and a remineralization and what happens around that and what can affect that. And, and he, he leads into this next thing and he calls it stable remodeling. So, and, and, and John, we've seen this and I've, as I've tracked my implants that I've placed over the years and my surgeon's implants that he's placed. And if you look at it, and you start taking x-rays once a year, bite wings. And we're talking about bite wings. We're not talking about CTs. We're talking about good bite wing shots across your implants that have been restored. You actually see remodeling occur whenever you use some of the concepts that he's promoting in this book. And it's like, whoa, I'm not getting bone loss. I'm getting, I'm getting actually remodeling. I'm actually seeing things change over mm-hmm. time. And... Yep. I, I like that is that whenever we implement these things, 
there's less chance to have some of the complications that he brings up later on, right? Periimplantitis, right? We don't mm-hmm. know how to treat that. And if we have, when we have these concepts that are implemented, the chance to develop this periimplantitis thing, which we don't know how to treat, he talks about that, that's whenever the lowest. Mm-hmm. So if you're placing an implant right now, what Tomas is saying, you need to do everything you can to treatment plan the case so that it promotes, before the implant's even placed, before the implant's even placed, this surgical portion of this book, you need to take the things into account that are going to promote <clears throat> zero bone loss concepts. In fact, stable bone remodeling over the patient's lifetime. John? Yep. Yeah, and, I, and you know, as he goes into... We're not going to necessarily go through what each one of these different ways that right. bone can behave because it's a lot. All I think we need to know from that is that he claims that we need to be moving as close to zero bone loss as we can. And there are different ways bone can change around implants, and he talks some about some of the theories behind it. But essentially what he's claiming here is that we need to understand that bone stability is important. And as we go into the next section of this chapter, he's talking about how This is most important in a few situations. One is in the aesthetic zone because you obviously have to have the pillar in the right place. We understand that with uh, what uh, Dennis Tarnow showed years ago, that bone and papilla presence are directly correlated by the contact position measurement to the bone. So if you don't Mm -hmm. have bone, you're not going to potentially have uh, papilla formation. And also is when we have short implants. We know short implants work. We've talked great length about that on the show. Uh, we know that we've, we've got plenty of research now. So if we're losing 0.2 millimeters per year around <laughs> a six millimeter implant, you better hope you've moved to another town uh, by the time that got, that person's kids are in high school because they're going to have all their implants fall out apparently. So we know that you know the more the shorter the implant the more the stability matters. Yeah, and I think, too, he brings up the fact that as we move to a shorter implant uh, style of implant practice, which, you know, John and I have moved in that direction, is that it does lend, and we've brought this up on the show before, is that you need to choose an implant that has a great connection because if you don't, then you're going to have some more of these mechanical problems like he talks about. Screw screw loosening can be expected with shorter implants if you don't have you know, a properly uh, connected abutment to those things. So don't, you don't want to lose 1.5 millimeters around your short implants in the first year. So I think the next thing that really leads to maybe some factors too is this operator error. And he's really clear on this is that as you become a seasoned placer, meaning mm-hmm. like the more experience you get in placing dental implants, the less implant bone the blown loss that you're going to see around your dental implants it don't, and i mean and, and that's true because your experience with surgical techniques and how to achieve soft tissues will get into around your dental implants these operator dependent factors are part of the things that could lead to crystal bone loss mm-hmm. and um, i think it's important to realize that he also talks about misdiagnosis and you know basically looking at systemically Periodontal disease is something we'll talk about in the future on this show because, you know, the American Academy of uh, of Periodontology is all the time updating how they're looking Mm -hmm. at perio in patients. And I think it's something for us to keep our eyes, you know, fixed on something like a disease like this that we don't know how to treat. But please properly diagnose and treat your patients with perio. That's what he's saying here is because if you don't have the if you don't have soft tissue, you're in trouble already. Well, and I want to go back just real quick to these operator-dependent factors. I mean, he talks about a lot of them, but there's a huge list. But one of the mm-hmm. couple of things that he really focuses on is um, he, he focuses on using an implant system for the first time often results in excessive bone compression. Oh. And uh, this is one of the, the, the things that's interesting. You know, this is during seating the implant, if you have very dense bone, very stiff bone, and you're going to generate heat as a result of friction and compression, bone loss can result. And he said, you know, this needs to be distinguished from other types of bone resorption because it's present before the healing abutment is connected. So if you, you know, place a implant and cover it 
you're going to see that bone loss before you even connect something that would create a micro gap. And I think that is important that uh, you know this this whole idea of high torque is maybe not the right words we should be using. It should be excessive compression, heat generation, mm -hmm. um, that especially in this cortical plate, which is largely avascular, mm -hmm. often thin, and in a less experienced implant placer's hands, or in somebody who's trying to generate maximum torque every single time. Well, we know the maximum insertional torque value really that you should be exerting on any implant system, no matter what the manufacturer says, according to the torque people. Like we're talking about the most researched people on the podium, mm -hmm. not just podium preachers. We're talking about people that are well-researched. It's 45 Newton centimeters. Mm -hmm. So if you're going in, you know, and maxing out your torque and putting implants in at 90 90 Newton centimeters or anything above 45, then you might Yeah, there's expect, some risks. There might expect some compression here on that cortical bone, and that is avascular tissue, so be careful about that. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, he doesn't go into the, all the other operator error factors like mishandling of sutures or flaps, but he does mention that uh, very directly, and I think that that's important. Um, but this is where he talks about the last things mm. here, which is really the crux of this book, it's awesome. is the zero bone loss factors. Right. And these are ideal clinical situations. So in other words, he says, there are things that cause bone loss that may not be clear to the clinician. And that, folks, is why we're here today. It's really to talk about, we all kind of know that excessive compression is a problem. We kind of know the perio could be a potential problem. But what are these what are these factors that may not be clear? He says, for example, there may be an ideal clinical situation, sufficient bone height and width, two millimeters or more of attached tissues, implant placement in the correct three-dimensional position, but crestal bone loss still occurs. It's not a good situation to be in when the first follow-up appointment demonstrates a degree of failure. I love and so, he says. He says, uh, yeah. basically, people tell clini the clinicians tell the patients, oh, yep. it's okay. It'll grow back. It'll get right. better. Or it'll stop. It'll stop. Yep. And, yep. you know, <clears throat> this is interesting because this doesn't always happen, right? Right. So and then he says, very... oh, yeah, no, go ahead, Wes. Well, I was just going to say, go ahead and tell it. Go ahead and say oh, it. I was, well, I mean, he, his idea there is, all right, so we all know that you, you have this perfect, quote, unquote, perfectly placed implant, right? And you have bone loss continue and you're going, why? Like three-dimensionally, everything looks okay. Um, I, I handled the flap right, the sutures. And he shows a beautiful case, beautiful case here where everything mm -hmm. looks like it was done right, plenty of bone, perfect sutures, perfect flap design, and then progressive bone loss. So how could this have been avoided? And he says, well, let's basically have two major groups of factors mm -hmm. responsible for crustal bone loss that stand out in general. Implant design factors and biologic factors. Implant design factors are implant abutment connection with microgap and polished implant neck. Biologic factors are one, vertical soft tissue thickness. You might have heard that before on the show. And number two, attached tissues. So he pretty much right there lays out that there are biologic and there are implant design factors that he believes, not just he believes, but that he's studied that he feels that are directly causing the implant to have crustal bone loss, even when it's in an ideal placement situation from a standpoint of three-dimensionally placed, good bone thickness, and what looked to be a great situation. I love his conclusion here that he describes this metaphor. Imagine a basket of apples. Each apple represents a specific factor. The purpose of research is to take one apple out of the basket and study it alone, eliminating the confounding, the confounding factors. And then you got to put that apple back into the basket, meaning that all factors are operating simultaneously in reality. So you might be able to say, a study proved that implants with platform switching works better at maintaining bone stability but that doesn't mean that every implant with platform switching will perform better than every implant without platform switching. It's not absolute dogma because, for instance, if there's no attached immobile gingiva bone, may still resorb even if platform switching is used. So right. very difficult 
to, it's like when they do these studies, Wes, about, you know, um, what causes cancer. And right. you're studying, if, and, and you know, you'll say, oh, according to a new study, if you consume more than six cups of coffee a day, or, or maybe that's not a good example. If you, if you don't exercise, that you'll get a higher rate of cancer. But the same people that aren't exercising maybe have other factors that they're also doing that could contribute. And it's not impossible, but it's very hard to take out these variables unless you do a ton of studies. And right. so, Wes, what were the take-home messages, do you think, from so, this first chapter? Interesting. I think that truly as a clinician, that bone loss is a multifactorial issue. And that's not an excuse. I really want you to realize that it's not an excuse to not understand that. Meaning like you shouldn't just look at your case and just say, well, we don't know what it caused it. We, it just happens, you know. Well, everybody makes mistakes, right? And the, the true error, right, and he says this, is knowingly doing the same thing again and not correcting it. Mm. And so the interesting thing with dental practicing <clears throat> is that we have to realize that just about everything we do has multifactorial things. And that goes along with this crestal bone loss. And there's no single most important factor. I think it's important to know that, and he brings this up, is there's certain design factors that include the presence or absence of this polished collar. He already has bring this, he's bringing this up and the implant com connection issue. Right, he's bringing this up that that there's some things here we already need to start looking at, and then the last thing is the biology. We have to have enough vertical soft tissue thickness and attached gingiva around our dental implants, and so it's a multifactorial thing. I think that he set the ground up for what surgically is going to help us one in this next chapter start to learn. Lord, what is what type of design should we look at when it comes to dental implants? Can we choose one and use it for everything? And and then we're going to also kind of get into what should we start to look at as far as tissue and soft tissue augmentation, connections, and all those things. So, John, as we move into this next chapter, uh, implant design factors, let's, we've talked about this for years, about what we think matters long term with dental implant design. Let's talk about this book and what he brings to the table about what his favorite implant or seems to be his favorite implant design and why he's choosing that for the type of uh, implant therapy he provides to his patients. Yeah, yeah. Chapter two is all about implant design factors. And I love, I, this is one of, the, one of my favorite chapters because this is where marketing gets thrown out the window. <laughs> and we're not going to sure. talk about marketing here because we're going to talk about what's actually been studied. Yeah. And I love this. And he basically breaks this down into two concepts here, the presence or absence of a polished implant neck and the implant abutment connection or micro gap. These being yep. the two major differences. And as he starts going into this, he's basically going to summarize <clears throat> what we know about different types of designs and one of the first things he talks about is just a, for instance, that you need to understand what you're actually placing. Yeah, basically, oh. how familiar are you? I have a slide in some of my old implant lectures, and, it, and, I, and I talk about, like, if somebody showed up to your back door and they were getting ready to paint your deck, right, mm. don't you think that they would know all about the paint that they're getting ready to use on your deck? I mean, like agnosium i mean they're they're just like they know so much about it they're what they're a professional painter right so let me ask you this how much time have you spent looking at the parts book for your dental implant placement mm. how much time have you studied looking at the thread design the pitch right? All of the things. Do you know what type of grade of titanium they're using? Do you know what the alloy is made up of? I think that the familiarity, this is what gets me, John, because if I understand the implant thread type, pitch, 
what each thread type does. I understand simple mechanics behind the connection and what polish looks like, how polish is created, how sandblasting affects it, how etching, what all this means. If I understand that, it makes me a better surgeon. It makes me a better restoring doctor because then I know how to tell the surgeon or myself how to apply <clears throat> that design to my surgical principles. Yeah, and he has a great example of this because he says – you know, that, that uh, Luigi Canulo showed that platform shift has to be at least 0.4 millimeters in order for it to actually work. But there are multiple implants <clears throat> on the market now that don't even have that 0.4 millimeter platform shift, and therefore, they're just the same as a standard implant. So do you know how much of a platform shift your implant has? Well, oh, man. You, you should. And if you don't, that's okay. This is where we start to, to dive into that, is right. understanding that. So he goes into polish collar. And I'm going to basically summarize this down into what we know. <laughs> all right? Please, this is a such a good topic. bone will not attach to a polished collar. Please say that again, John. Yeah. Bone will not attach to a polished collar. So if you put... A polished collar implant, no matter how, if it's a 0.5 millimeter polished collar, if mm. it's a 0.1 millimeter polished collar, or if it's like a one millimeter polished collar, if you place that subcrestal or just below the bone or equa crestal, will bone grow around that polished collar? Bone will not attach to a polished collar. I feel like so, I need to record that. What you're saying, John, over. is is over. that if you have a polished collar, then don't place it below bone. Right, unless you want bone loss. Unless you and, want bone loss. Yeah, I mean, you just need to understand that there is no way, no matter how much you countersink it, no matter what you do, no matter how, what the design is, if it has a polished collar, then you better have that polished collar above bone level if you want to maintain the bone. Anytime a polished collar touches bone, during placement, you will be losing that bone, and you will be losing that bone early because bone will never, ever, ever, so ever attach to it. So the very first principle in zero bone loss concepts is not to place polished collar implants subcrestal or below bone. Yep. That's that's, that's, that's lesson number thing. one. from that's from lesson chap number one. It's lesson number one in zero bone okay. loss concepts. Now, let's move Le on. Yeah, micro gap. Let's move on. And micro let's gap. move on. Micro gap. And, and so we know that not all implants have a polished collar, but all two-piece implants do have a micro gap. And Please repeat that. Yeah. So all <laughs> two-piece implants have a micro gap. But okay? marketing tells me, John, marketing <laughs> tells me <laughs> right. that there are some There is no micro gap, right? There is no micro gap. There My is implant no connection is so good. That right. there is no micro gap. And it's a cold take weld. take a two piece and make a one piece <laughs> implant out of two pieces. If right. you understand anything about mechanics, right? That's impossible. Right. right. You're not exactly. welding two pieces together. <laughs> right. And he will later talk about single implants because right. some people prefer them, but he says there's actually some things to single piece implants do not show lower levels of bone loss and the design harbors a critical flaw and that only cemented restorations can I'll be placed. i comment on this because this makes me feel good about something I did I didn't even know I was doing. <laughs> I used concepsis down in the connection of my dental implants mm -hmm, or hexidine. Mm -hmm. And yep. he mentions that in here. I don't know, it's side note, little commentary here <laughs> is yep. that, you know, one of the things that I do every time I disconnect or reconnect a part to my dental implants I take concepsis and scrub it down into uh, my implant connection. And he talks about that that's, that's something that you can do uh, yep. whenever you're dealing with submerged, uh, subcrestally placed implants. So when you talk about a micro gap, what is the micro gap? Because this is a concept that I think often is misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Basically, when you have an abutment and an implant, that are connected together, you create a zone where bacteria can hang out. A right. zone where bacteria can hang out between those two components. It may be very small, but it's always there. And we know that bacteria infiltrate an implant. 
We know that it happens during implant placement, during the prosthetic phase, and during loosening of the abutment after some function. And the there is something, you know, you mentioned that, yes, Wes, some implant companies will say they have no micro gap. So that may not be true. That is not true. But it is important to note that there are some implant connections that have smaller micro gaps than others. And his point here is we should be shooting for the smallest micro gap possible because it is surely a good thing. Um, so we do want to look at that. And he talks about the fact that different types of connections have potentially less micro gap. And really it all comes down to stability um, in the long run though, because one thing is how big is the micro gap to begin with? Mm -hmm. But the next thing is how stable is the implant? Because you might have whatever amount of micro gap, but what happens when you put that under function and you start pushing that abutment side to side, up and down, what actually happens? And we know from our time back in uh, uh, AstroTech days that Ziprich uh, did some studies on this, very interesting studies, where he pushed on implants and showed them under very high magnification and showed these abutments, uh, gaps opening uh, between these. And, and so then uh, Lingavicious talks about this, that micro movement of the abutment and the micro gap could open and close and kind of have a pump a pumping action and there's also essentially this accumulation of inflammatory infiltrate near the micro gap which is going to create basically chronic inflammation and then we have bone loss so he goes through great detail on how this has been confirmed and says that bone may recede up to two millimeters to maintain an appropriate distance from the source of an infection. So we want to have the smallest micro gap we can. We want to have the most stability that we can, which by the way, using a conical connection is always recommended. So he says that, but the connection stability is even more important yeah, when the stability. implant is placed subcrestally. Yeah, connection stability is basically after the patient is chewing on the abutment crown is that you don't get opening or a large opening and separation of the two parts under load, right? There's going to be a micro gap, but how stable is that connection? Mm -hmm. And he goes in and he talks about how important that is, especially when we're placing these implants subcrestally. If yep. you're going to place an implant subcrestal, choose an implant that has a stable internal conical connection. Yep. That's, and I think that's, that's, the, that's, that's, that's kind of a, if that's another really a take home message. I mean, if you didn't hear that, if you you're going it? to place an implant <laughs> subcrestal, it should have, ideally, a very stable, deep conical connection. That doesn't mean that if you don't have a deep connection, that the implant's not good. It means if you're placing the implant subcrestally, then the connection matters more. Now, this seems pretty obvious, and yet it's not really talked about. No. It's just sort of like, well, this is the best connection. Well, okay, if this is the best connection, it's the best connection for where? Because so, the, a lot of connections will work if you put them above the bone. Yeah. What matters is when you're trying to place it below the bone, and we'll talk later about why would you want to put it below the bone, but it's important to think about this that, you know, you might, and he goes into remember this whole idea. Remember, bone loss, let me see if I can repeat, yeah. the bone yeah. loss around implants is a multifactorial issue. And so what we're doing and what he's doing is he's building a case throughout the book of all the factors. And when you put all these together, the mechanical pieces that we're using in our dental implant, that's why he says it's important to understand the mechanics behind the connection, the type of implant you have, yep. and how that affects you surgically can be a role. Because he shows one of the the implants that was designed to be placed subcrestal has a deep conical connection in the middle of in the end of this chapter, um, a ankylos implant, which has a Morse taper and it has platform switching. And he shows bone loss 
yep. around these implants. And what he says is, is that this proves implant design is not just the single factor. Right, right. Because I want to, I want to focus on this whole thought of what could really expand on this. I think it's so important we hammer on this that if you if you want to talk about this connection and this micro gap and this difference, what he's saying here is not that you can't that connection. We should just say, well, you have to have only a deep conical connection. He's mm -hmm. saying if you're going to put it more subcrestal, that's important. But what about if you're not? What about if you are going to just use a different design? Say just a matching design, a flat-to-flat right. -flat connection, flat -to -flat. Not, not a conical. Hex. And basically he's saying, okay, so it may be, he says, it may be reasonable to position an implant with a matching non-conical connection supracrestally supracrestally why would that be because the micro gap is now elevated away from the bone and he showed in his own studies that supracrestally placed implants in a thick tissue biotype which we're going to get to showed 0.68 millimeters of bone loss which is lower than the same implants placed crestally so make sure you get that if you left the micro gap above the bone you had less bone loss than if you put a not so nice connection at the crest because you were moving the micro gap up away from the bone. So going back to this whole polished collar implant idea, why do Strawman polished collar implants work? And why do they have such a small amount of bone loss? John it's just answered it for you and Tomas talks about it in his book. Basically, polished collars are not meant to be placed below the bone because bone right. doesn't grow on a polished collar. They're made to be placed supracrestally and the connection on these does not have to be robust. Yeah, right? and it is a good connection. It's a great it connection. it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Because it could you're, be, it could you're be 1 1.3, 1 1.5 away from the bone. So we know at this point your micro gap is away from the bone. So, so even it, if it your connection is horrible. Affect, it doesn't affect the bone loss, right? Right. But there so, are other factors that might, and we're going to talk about that because, again, you can see cases, Wes, where you see a nice polished collar implant mm -hmm. placed with the micro gap away from the bone, and yet you could still have bone loss. So as we move on, we're going to talk more about why would that be, but let's talk about the last kind of big things in this chapter. One is platform switching. Yep. Platform switching. And this is a really significant design feature. Well, because here's the thing is that the marketing played such a role in this. Well, you're getting oh, yeah. bone loss, and our implant doesn't have bone loss, but if you're worried about bone loss, then we should just put a smaller diameter abutment on mm -hmm. our implant, and that's going to solve all your problems because that's going to move the micro gap horizontally, not mm -hmm. vertically, horizontally away f from the bone. So therefore... The con con this is where platform switching came out. Interesting yep. thing is there was a lot of conical implant, internal conical connection implants, and because of the type of connection that they had internally conically designed, they almost had platform shifting or platform switching built into the implant. And a mm -hmm. lot of implants that he showcases in here, the platform shift, because it's an internal conical connection, is built into the design of the abutment already. Yep, yep. And, and I think it's important that platform shifting what has been shown mm -hmm. definitely when you create an equal study here, right, where the tissue thickness is the same, right. placement is the same, implants the same, there is a difference in bone loss with platform shifting. So there is some good science to show it. And, and the final thing is talking about specifics about connections. Yeah, micro because we. We know, yeah, we know about different connections, but what's the specifics? What is it? What is the difference in movement? And he talks about specifically the Morse taper connection, which has only two to four degrees of angulation. The best known brands are Ankylos, Bicon, and there's other systems that are newer uh, that use them as well. And then you got conical connections with are wide, which are wider, like Strom and Astra. Uh, and then you've got some bigger quote-unquote conicals, <laughs> which are greater than 10 or 20 degrees. And he just cites Ziprich and found that the more the steeper the angulation, in other words, 
the the more two to four degrees, right? Two to four degree taper was the best at reducing micro movement. So we should uh, it be advised that that the steeper the connection, better in terms of micro movement. But he does point out, and we Wes and I have talked about this. A steeper conical connection, though, creates some problems if you're yeah, trying to you splint your restoration. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, to too tight of a draw. Stages. So I think the take home message: polished collars don't integrate and will right. cause bone loss if you put them into bone. We don't want a micro gap that's huge. We want to minimize it. We like platform shifting, and we know that a conical connection does provide more stability but it's not a guarantee of no bone loss. So all these things are things we should be moving more toward where we can. So that's our chapter two, and that is, man, heavy good, duty, Wes. Good stuff. So, John, surgically, how deep should I place my implant? If mm. I choose this type of implant that you're saying, maybe an internal conical connection, how deep do we go? And that's chapter three. Do you place it one millimeter subcrestal? Do you just place it equal crestal? How deep do we place our dental implants? Well, if we have a polished collar, we don't place our implants <laughs> below bone, right? right? Right. So polished collars will not integrate. I think like he's 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 just really pounding this home because there's so many people that place polished collar implants. Yep. Subcrestal. Sub yep. Or and crestal. That's yeah. a that's going to cause bone loss over mm -hmm. time. The correct position of an implant without platform switching, get this, the correct position of an implant without platform switching is about one millimeter above bone. So if you don't have the ability to platform switch your implant, then you better place it above bone, whether it has a one millimeter polished collar or not. Mm -hmm. So you're already kind of fighting a little bit of an uphill battle. So this is why you have to know your system. Yep. Okay, so ideally, um, implants with a polished collar, this implant should be placed above the bone, okay? The polished and portion. Polished portion above the bone. And what about this? If you have micro threads or a rough surface towards the coronal portion of the implant, mm. where should that be placed? That should be placed below the bone. You should not place implants with, that are rough above the bone. They should not be placed in soft tissue. So that means if you've got, you're doing your surgery and you're like, gag, torqued out, torqued out. I got a half a millimeter left. There's a thread exposed. What are you going to do? Are you going to back it out and increase the depth of your osteotomy? Are you going to try to over torque it? And just drive it deeper because you got some nice V threads there and just say, mm. turn it up to infinity and beyond and just drive it deeper. Are you going to back it out and lengthen your osteotomy and place it with respect to the bone and place that? He says, basically, a very rough surfaces that are meant to form bone should not be positioned super crestally. Okay, let's move on here. Well, if and why he also says, too, that if you have, um, if you have, a rougher surface, it's true that you might get better connective tissue attachment, but but if you get an issue with periimplantitis, mm. you're going to have a potential problem with that maintain maintaining that rough and surface because it's a it's a bacterium magnet. So I just want to point that out that you know this is why he says you can put the polished collar uh, ab slightly above, mm -hmm. but and you want to because you don't want to lose bone. But if it's rough and you leave it exposed, you better hope you don't get a periimplantitis problem or else we're going to be in bigger trouble. Listen, if there's an aesthetic concern at all, okay, if you have aesthetics in mind, he says this, bone level implants with platform shifting and a conical connection should be chosen. Hmm. And implants with polished parts should be avoided. I think it's mm -hmm. important to understand this. Again, if you have an aesthetic thing and you're doing an anterior implant on your wife, you want a rough and surfaced implant all the way to the coronal third, you want platform switching, and you want to place that implant below bone. Otherwise, there could be an aesthetic problem. We could have an aesthetic dilemma, and then pink scores start to come into play, and we don't we know where that leads. Pink porcelain or soft tissue trying to cover up stuff, it's just not there. 
And I like what he says, too, that he says that uh, if you're going to go there, subcrestal, Mm -hmm. that now we're dealing with the microgab that's getting placed deeper in the bone. So once you start getting to that point and you know your microgap is going to be below bone, then now we need to have certain certain interesting criteria we have to meet, which is we need to know that we have a stable implant abutment connection. And he says this, the deeper the implant is positioned in the bone, the more important the stability of the connection becomes. We're going to talk more about that as we go on, but he says... You know, if you if you're only going maybe one millimeter, one millimeter subcrestal, maybe you don't have to have this a Morse taper. But if you're going three, you better have a Morse taper because if not, your micro gap now and this in a no, negative connection, a bad connection, is going to start to play a role because you are so far below the bone, uh, and the forces are going to be different. So you need to be sure that you're aware. So it's starting to push us west more toward, as you said in the aesthetic zone especially, that you would go to uh, an implant with platform shifting, you go to an implant that has a very stable connection, and you would be going toward subcrestal positioning of that implant. Uh, I don't know about you, but most of my ridges are not flat like this table surface that I have my book laying on. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but to get that thread down below the buckle plate... Um, in a healed ridge site, you know, you end up subcrestal on the palatal or lingual surface, mm, mm-hmm. maybe two, three millimeters sometime. Yep. So what you end up, you know, kind of like trying to figure out is this happy medium of like, what do you do? Do you graft? Do you do, you do all these things? And I think for, for what he's saying here is that you want to choose an implant that you can place subcrestal because the anatomy of the mouth is such that we want to be able to, to tuck it down and not worry about it. And if you don't want to worry about it, then you need to choose an implant that has a deep conical connection, right? Yep. But you're going to accept yep. some things with that deep conical connection. We're going to get into that, right? There are some caveats. We've already mentioned yep. one, splinting implants side by side with deep conical connections. It's impossible to do, right? But there are some advantages, and he talks about that, but there's also some div- disadvantages. So... One of the things that's great about bone level implants is that they are, uh, most of them have the ability to be platform switched, okay? And that's Mm -hmm. good because we're placing them below bone, right? Sometimes one, maybe two millimeters. In extreme cases, it might be three millimeters. So you need that prosthetic platform switching ability to emerge up out of the bone channel per se, John, that you created there. <laughs> right? Oh, man. That's yeah. a little side yeah, story. Yeah, a sidebar. Right yeah. Sidebar. Those that are listening <laughs> know yeah. about these A few people ch- just got that. Yeah, a few people got that. <laughs> but I think it's important to know that, that we, we, are, we are saying here is that we want to place our implants, if we want to place our implants subcrestally, and we need to choose an implant design that supports that. And to be honest with you, there's not a lot out there, John, that supports subcrestal placement. And you need to be very careful about right. what implant Just because design. your implant has a roughened surface yeah. to the top does not mean That's right. that it is really a good implant to place subcrestal if you don't have, number one, platform shifting, number two, a stable connection. Uh, mm-hmm. And the micro gap becomes very important. Micro movement becomes very important. And so you might be better off in some of these situations uh, if, if, you're, if you know your connection's not great, but you want to keep using that system to move to an implant that's more of a tissue level or has yeah, a polished that's, that's collar. what he talks about next is these tissue level implants. And pretty much they're defined as, he says, any, if an implant has a polished collar of 1.8 millimeters or greater, it's considered a tissue level implant. One of the peculiarities, he says, of this so-called double micro gap, there is one micro gap at the implant abutment connection, while the second micro gap is located on the slope of the plane of the polished collar. We've all seen these polished collar implants that have this polished emergence profile. And I think it's important to understand, one, where should that polished collar be placed? Above (laughs) the bone. Yep. And time and time again, it's funny to me, John, but we see these podium speakers talking about utilizing these implants in the aesthetic zone. It's very dangerous. 
It's very, yep. very dangerous. Yep, I agree. And I think that, that it's important that you just know where to place these tissue level implants and how to place them. Once again, as long as you're putting that polished collar into the tissue and you're in an area where that tissue thickness is adequate, which again, we'll talk about later, um, these can work great. But you're going to have to deal with some issues. You're going to have this tissue that can impinge the seating of the restoration. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to deal with, if you have thin tissue, you may show implant uh, gray through that. And uh, it's, not, it's not a bad situation uh, on one hand, but it's something you just need to manage completely different uh, than, uh, than you would if it was a bone level type of implant with a roughened surface. I remember the first time that I talked about placing implants subcrestally. A lot of clinicians had an issue because it was harder to restore, mm -hmm. right? And you have to get used to working with implants that are placed subcrestally mm -hmm. uh, because you have more tissue in the way. You have greater impingement of abutments. As soon as you take the abutment off, tissues start to drop in. Patients start to feel the pinching. And in the beginning, 15 years ago, man, nobody liked dealing with that, man. Yep, and yep. The, because they had to numb their patients up or they had to do other things to, you know, to, uh, to, to help, you know, a doctor under, understand how to restore, much less a surgeon know how to place it. Yep. And uh, we can get into some more things here. But restoration material is kind of this next thing he talks about in this chapter of implant placement depth. And he says that it's important to understand what ch that choosing the type of implant okay bone level without platform switching bone level with platform switching or tissue level dictates the choice of the restoration john you teach the portion of restorative driven implants where we talk about this idea of emergence profile mm -hmm. and and how does this position of the implant and what type of implant we choose affect what you're able to do with restorations. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that uh, he, you know, there's kind of two ideas behind that. One is your your placement, of course, the, the deeper that you place an implant allows you more what we call prosthetic running room. So in other words, more mm -hmm. room to develop your emergence profile from the top of the implant to the abutment and finally to the crown. So you don't have a you don't have an abrupt emergence, as they say, kind of an apple on a stick. Mm -hmm. But the other thing he really focuses more on than emergence profile is material selection. Yep. And he talks about how, hey, if you're using a tissue level implant and your micro gap is way above, you're not even connecting your restoration near the bone. You're nowhere near the bone. So you kind of can use whatever you want. But once you start getting closer to bone level type of implants, your material starts to matter more. That's you what need we're to get have into those more, other chapters, right? Yeah, you need to have more biologically compatible materials. And he talks about zirconia there. He talks about how, you know, when you start talking about bone level implants, you're subcrestal. You want to use materials that have the least amount of plaque accumulation, uh, the most biocompatible zirconia. He really likes for these where possible. And he just basically says this, the choice of prosthetic material for bone level implants is more important than for tissue level implants. It makes sense because you're going to be putting your restorative material further down into the tissues and maybe even nearer, nearer to the bone if you're working with a subcrestally placed implant. So your, 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 your type of material starts to matter. You want something that's biologically very, very compatible. So John, you know, I think I got from this, this, this implant design concept here and how it affects, let's kind of sum up these last few chapters before we get into the next segment. Because we've been talking a lot about bone and we're talking about mm -hmm. a lot about where we should put our implants. But if I was going to choose an implant based on what I've read here, one, if I was going to choose an implant, I would want to be able to have the most degree of freedom in that placement. So I'm going to choose mm -hmm. an implant that has, one, the ability to be placed subcrestally, right, in the aesthetic zone where I want to maximize aesthetics. Like aesthetics are the king. If I want my posterior implants to look aesthetically amazing, then I'm going to choose an implant that I can place subcrestally. That means I need a deep conical connection. I need stability in that connection. It needs to be rock solid. And, and if I'm not so much concerned about aesthetics, you know, I'm just like, hey, man, I just want to place an implant, then I might just want to place a polished collar implant. Right? Yeah, and it gives you the advantage of maybe and more it, cleansability, more and this cleansability. from the standpoint, if you're right. worried about periimplantitis. But I, but I don't care about aesthetics, John. 
So if you right. don't care about aesthetics, choose a polished collar. If you care about aesthetics, yep. choose a subcrestally designed placed implant that has a stable conical connection. And yep. um, I think that's kind of summing it up right there, don't John? Don't you think? Yeah. What, and, yeah. I think so, and I think we need to understand what implant does, how these implant design features, re what really matters, and and what's actually been proven. And it doesn't so much matter. I mean, you can argue about is it you know micro grooves, is it micro right. threads, is it laser lock, we is see it all, all this, this stuff? But yeah. but all of these things in the end. I, I mean, that's why when we talked to Dennis Tarnow, I mean, how long did he spend? talking about surface roughness yeah. and how there's a certain amount of roughness you want for bone to adhere, but a certain amount of roughness that you don't want. Yep. Nobel has an entire con new concept about how to have the surface roughness where you want it, but have it smooth and cleansable where you don't want that to be a problem for periimplantitis. So I think in the end, you can play those games or you can just simplify Right. We like to simplify here, and I don't think it's just simplifying. It's really doing the state-of-the-art treatment, which is choose an implant that can be placed subcrestal as long as anatomy allows, right, for you to do right. that. Place the implant subcrestal, but make sure you have a great connection to back you up. And then choose a restorative material that is kind to the tissues. Right. I think if you if you start there, and, and, and of course, as we said at the beginning, don't be stupid about your surgical technique. You know, learn how to place implants without you know having to go crazy with torque and have a bunch of compression on your bone mm -hmm. um that's the basics of how to start but we're just ba we're just scratching the surface here Wes because you can do all these things you can do all the things we've talked about but then you can still sometimes see bone loss even if you have all these factors so there's so much more we're going to be talking about as we get into the next part of this so I think, Wes, this is a great place yeah. to take a break, and we're going to be back. In the next episode, we're going to pick right back up where we left off here, going into Chapter 4, which is on vertical soft tissue thickness. And if you know anything about Linkovicious, you know that this is really where he got his start. The issue in, is the tissue. Yes. I mean, this is the <laughs> thing that really got him famous was talking about soft tissue thickness and how that affects bone stability around implants. So you're going to want to stick with this. Get your perio this. probes out, guys. Hey, listen, right. if you've liked this episode, you've liked this commentary, we need you to give us a shout out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We love talking about science and we love talking about clinic, clinical dentistry. And we appreciate uh, that you for tuning into this. So if you haven't given us a review on, um, on any of the iTunes Please leave us a five-star review. Tell us why you like the Dental Guys. More importantly, um, tell a friend about the Dental Guys. Maybe somebody that's you know wanting to take it to the next level. That's what we're about. That's why we do this show is so that we can help. John and I can help each other take it to the next level so that we can share what we've learned so that maybe you can help a friend take it to the next level. That's what this show's all about. And so for, for Tomas, <laughs> for John... I'm Wes, and we are the Dental Guys.